You may be seated. Our scripture lesson today is from the New Testament book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the 19th chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. Once these things had come to an end, Paul, guided by the Spirit, decided to return to Jerusalem, taking a route that would carry him through the provinces of Macedonia and Achaia. He said, after I have been there, I must visit Rome as well. He sent two of his assistants, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he remained a while in the province of Asa. At that time, a great disturbance erupted about the way. There was a silversmith named Demetrius. He made silver models for Artemis' temple, and his business generated a lot of profit for the craftspeople. He called a meeting with these craftspeople and others working in related trades, and he said, Friends, you know that we are making an easy living from this business. And you can see and hear that this Paul has convinced and misled a lot of people, not only in Ephesus, but also throughout most of the province of Asia. He says that the gods made by human hands aren't real gods. This poses a danger, not only by discrediting our trade, but also by completely dishonoring the great goddess Artemis. The whole province of Asia, indeed, the entire civilized world worships her, but her splendor will soon be extinguished. Once they heard this, they were beside themselves with anger, and they began to shout, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was thrown into turmoil. They rushed as one into the theater, they seized Gaius and Artemis, Paul's traveling companions from the province of Macedonia. Paul wanted to appear before the assembly, but the disciples wouldn't allow him. Even some of the officials of the province of Asia, who were Paul's friends, sent word to him, urging him not to risk going into the theater. Meanwhile, the assembly was in a state of confusion. Some shouted one thing, others shouted something else. And most of the crowd didn't know why they were gathered. The Jews sent Alexandria in the front. and Some of the crowds directed their words toward him. He gestured that he wanted to offer a defense before the assembly. But when they realized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! This continued for about two hours. The city manager brought order to the crowd, and he said, People of Ephesus, doesn't everyone know that the city of Ephesus is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you must calm down. Don't be reckless. The men you brought here have neither robbed the temple nor slandered our goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and the craftspeople with him have a charge against anyone, the courts are in session and governors are available. They can press charges against each other there. Well, additional disputes can be resolved in a legal assembly. As for us, we are in danger of being charged with rioting today since we can't justify this unruly gathering. And after he said this, he dismissed the assembly. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, my friends, I want to begin today by thanking the many, many people in this gathering and those of my friends who are watching online and my family members who have sent me emails and text messages and cards, and those of you who were present at my sister's memorial service on Friday at Trinity Road Methodist Church. I want to issue a special word of thanks to Mr. Lynn Shirley, who volunteered his time to come to Trinity Road and record the service and set it up so that my family and friends who could not be there, like my younger sister who is dealing um, 
with various illnesses and will have eye surgery this week, they could see the service and celebrate my older sister's life with us. Your expressions, your time, your generosity, your reaching out and expressing concern and love give me a great feeling of comfort and strength in these difficult days. And I can't really express to you how much that means. You know, as a pastor, often we are in the position of walking the road of grief with other people and listening to the stories of your loved ones as you celebrate their lives and their love. And we can walk with you on that journey and never quite realizing how much it means to have someone walking there with us. It's a tremendous gift. A tremendous gift to me of being so loved by this congregation and by members of other congregations that I have served who took the time to send cards and to reach out to me. And so from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. I stand here before you today as one who admits that grief causes a sense of being lost yourself. You know, we talk about the death of a loved one and people say, I'm sorry for your loss. But there is a sense that those of us who are grieving feel lost ourselves. Feel lost and don't know how to go on without that person that we loved so dearly by our side. Figuring out what does life mean without that person, that person who was always there for us. Now that's kind of a heavy way for me to start a sermon, isn't it? But I realize that each and every one of us, if we haven't felt it already, we will feel it at some point in our life. This feeling of being lost. I look out at your beautiful faces and I Remember the ones you have lost, the lives that you celebrate, their beautiful love and their legacy. And as we navigate through this feeling of lostness ourselves, the good news of Jesus Christ is that when we are lost, Jesus finds us. I think that's why so many hymns talk about I once was lost, but now I'm found. Jesus is always looking for us and finding us in our lostness and helping us to find a way back to joy, helping us to find <clears throat> a way to peace, helping us to find a way back to living our days on this side of heaven. And so it's no surprise to me that the early followers of Jesus were often referred to as followers of the way. That's what that long passage that I read for you from the book of Acts called the followers of Jesus. They called the followers of Jesus the people of the way. They were not called Christians at first. They were called followers of the way. And in the Greek, the word that is used for way means a road or a highway, but the term soon began to mean a way of life, that they followed in the way of life that Jesus lived. Commitment, you see, to Jesus Christ and Christian discipleship presupposes that we live in a world where we often get lost. We get lost in the pain and the suffering and the busyness of life searching for direction and searching for purpose in life. It is easy and possible to get lost in so many different ways as we live on this side of heaven. But the good news of the gospel also presupposes that in Jesus we find a way, a way that will enable us to have an abundant life on this side of heaven. 
Christian discipleship is not an abstract philosophy. It's not an intellectual mind trip. It's not a code of beliefs, no matter how much we argue about beliefs. To be a Christian is to live in a certain way, to live our life the way that Jesus lived his life, to live a life of love and forgiveness, to live a life of grace being offered to others. Fred Craddock, the great preacher, once said, knowing God carries the assignment of living out the character of God. The goal of believing is for the will and the ways of God for this world to find their way into the way that we live our lives. It is not just about getting to heaven after we die. While Jesus promises us eternal life in heaven with him forever, Jesus' prayers were never that we might be taken out of this world. His prayers were that the kingdom of heaven might come to earth, that the love, the peace, and the grace that is heaven would be realized in earth. Brian McLaurin, whose books many of y'all have read, refers to this as stage four of our faith life, or what he calls living in harmony. The blending of intellectual Christian beliefs with a life that looks like Jesus. Where faith is free to live the way that Jesus lived. Where what is most important is not religious faithfulness, not upholding a political party or creed, but allowing everything that we hold dear, every belief and every value to be measured by love. What furthers love in this world? That's the aim of our life. My dear friend and clergy colleague, Joel Jones, was senior pastor at Trinum Road United Methodist Church for several years, just like Don Britt was. And Joel spoke at my sister's memorial service. And one of the things he said about Debbie is that Debbie truly loved Jesus and that that's the bottom line of life is helping others to see Jesus' love in us and Jesus' love for them through us. The Apostle Paul himself wrote to the Galatians, and as much theology as Paul wrote about and as often as he wrote about what we need to believe, Paul wrote to the Galatians and he said, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. His letter to the Romans is one of the grand theological expositions. And people argue and debate about beliefs in our own United Methodist Church, bless her heart, is being torn apart by people arguing about beliefs. But that same Paul who talked so much about beliefs said, when all is said and done, there's only one thing that matters. Only one thing when it comes to faith. Did you make this world more loving? Did you choose love as the guiding force in your life? Now don't water down love to just being nice, please, because loving is about justice too. And someone wiser than I has said, what love looks like in public is justice. A public display of love is justice. At the end of our life, Don Britt almost always said at the funeral service, I remember this, the last word about our life is not death. It's life 
and his love. Our life goes on in God's presence, enveloped by God's great love for each one of us. Do you know the church, when it first started as a Protestant denomination, we were founded on those words of Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, here I stand. And in fact, we could argue that the whole modern culture that we live in today is founded on those three words, here I stand. Everybody wants to take a stand. Tell us what they think, and what they believe. But those words, my friends, are words that we got stuck in. For you see, the world has moved on. And as long as we stand still, we are not sharing love with the world. The problem with those words is that the words are wrong for the world that we live in today. There is a future that is different that COVID made us all so very, very aware of. And when we say, here I stand, we're focused so much on ourself that we're not thinking about others. And when we say stand, we don't realize that Jesus' word to us was go. Go on your way. Go and make disciples. Don't just stand there in your faith, resting on what you believe, saying, I've got my ticket to heaven. But go and share love and life with others. That's the way that Jesus modeled for us. Always going, going to the margins, going past the borders that others have put up. Jesus said, inasmuch as you do it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Go, go and do for others. Go and share the love that I have given to you. What Christ asks us to do is to pass on to others the life-giving gifts that we have received. We have received love and therefore we are to love. We have been forgiven and therefore we are to forgive. We have been blessed and therefore we are to bless others. We are to live a servant lifestyle like Christ did. We are to invest ourselves on the behalf of our neighbor's needs, not just when it's easy, not just when it's convenient, not just when it's in inexpensive, but even when it costs us something. The passage that I read from the book of Acts, the people following the way were living the life that Jesus lived, and people were attracted to that. And that threatened the people who were powerful and the people who were making money off of selling idols to the people. But that did not deter Paul and the other followers of Christ. They kept preaching love. They kept reaching out in love, no matter what the others were saying or doing or how they suffered because of it. Christ asked us to follow in the way that Jesus showed us how to live by doing what he asked us to do. I read an article not too long ago in one of those religious publications that us preachers often read, and it was talking about the decline of the church. Articles that we read way too often. But one of the things that I saw in that article that was really sad is it said that the United Methodist Church is the second oldest church. Not oldest in the fact that we've been established the longest, but oldest in the fact of our congregation members are aging and turning gray. Right? Where are the 20 year olds? There are a couple of you here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Where are the teenagers? 
Where are the young people in our churches? It made me wonder, why aren't they here? Why aren't they here? Maybe the young people these days aren't here because they don't see the Jesus way of life among the people of the church. Now, I'm preaching to the choir at this congregation, I know, because you are a loving congregation. But we can all do more. As I gave a witness to my sister's life during her memorial service, I shared with people that whenever someone dies, I listen and learn about their life. And I tell family members to keep st sharing the stories of that person's life because we can all learn lessons from the way that other people live their life, especially when they live a life of love. They encourage us even beyond their life on this side of heaven. They encourage us to be more loving. They encourage us to be more courageous in our faith. They encourage us to follow in the way of Christ. I believe that more people would be drawn to Jesus and to Jesus' church if we reflected Jesus ourselves more readily. I read two stories years ago that I kept in my files that remind me to keep looking at myself and asking, where am I falling short? Oh yeah, remember the Jesus way of life. Follow in that way. One of those stories is about Clarence Jordan. Some of y'all may recognize that name. Clarence Jordan was the founder of the Conania community in Georgia back in the turbulent days of the civil rights structure. And the Koinonia community was a cooperative farming project built on Christian foundations, which meant that it was open to everyone who wanted to come. It was an integrated community. And so it was constantly under attack, and frequently in court. Clarence Jordan asked his brother Robert to defend them in court. Robert was an attorney, and later he was a state senator and even a justice of the Georgia Supreme Court. And Robert said to Clarence, and I quote, I can't do that. You know my political aspirations. Why, if I represented you, I could lose my job. I would lose my home. I might lose everything. And Clarence said, well, we could lose everything too, you know. That's different, Robert said. Well, how's that different, Clarence asked. When we were boys, you and I joined the church on the same Sunday. And when we came forward, the preacher asked me the same question that he asked you. He asked, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, and will you follow him faithfully? And I said, yes. What did you say? And Robert said, well, I said, yes, I'll follow Jesus, but only up to a point. And Clarence said, could that point by chance be the cross? That's right, said Robert. I will follow Jesus to the cross, but I'm not going to get up on it. I'm not going to get myself crucified. And Clarence looked his brother in the eye, and he said, well, then, I don't believe you're really a follower of Jesus. You're an admirer of Jesus, but you're not a follower. So why don't you go back to the church you belong to and tell them that you want to be an admirer of Jesus, not a follower. Now that's strong stuff, but it makes me look at my commitment to following the way of Jesus. If it's on target, 
then I will do unto others as I would have them do unto me. That I would do unto the least as if I am doing unto Christ. I will love as I have received love. I will forgive as I have for been forgiven. And I will bless others as I have been blessed. Because the way of Jesus invites everyone into the kingdom, includes everyone at the banquet table. Jesus invites everyone to his table to sit together and to get to know one another, to sit together and to share a meal of bread and wine, reminding us that he is with us and that he loves us all and he will give us the strength and the courage that we need to live his way of life. And so I invite you all to come to this table and receive this gift of love and forgiveness once again in your life to be reminded of how much you are loved and how much you are blessed and how much you are forgiven to be nourished and strengthened to live the Jesus way of life each and every day moving forward. For Christ our Lord invites us all to this table, all who earnestly repent of every way that we have fallen short. And so I invite you to join me in the prayer, the prayer of confession that you have printed in your bulletin today. Let us pray. Dear God of truth and grace, forgive us when we are tempted to turn to the many false gods out there. Gods like politics, vanity, consumerism, achievement, or constant satisfaction. You are the Lord of Lords, our true north, our first love. Help us place you at the center of our thoughts. Discover you to be the ground beneath our walking and stand firm on trust in you as the foundation on which we build our lives. Forgive us, free us for joyful obedience, and make us whole in the name. Amen.